Hello and uh, welcome uh, everyone to the Nobel Peace Center here in Oslo, Norway today. Yesterday was a day of great joy. We celebrated two new Peace Prize laureates. And today we are going to continue the celebrations as we will throughout the whole of next year. But let me start by congratulating the prize winners, Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov, <laughs> uh, on receiving the Nobel Peace Prize for 2021 and their uh, work with uh, uh, freedom of speech, democracy and, uh, and peace. Uh, and I also want to congratulate the committee with an excellent choice. This comes in a time uh, where this issue is so important. And we can read from all the editors and all articles throughout the world the last day how important and how well received this prize really is. Um, the last year we have seen the stabilizing effect also of fake news and that was also part of the uh, reason why uh, the prize was given to these laureates yesterday. Today we are going to have a panel discussion and we're going to have uh, uh, other interesting people here up on the, on the stage. But first and foremost, we're going to have the leader of the Nobel Committee, Berit Reis Andersen, uh, to come up on the stage, please. Um, we have an interesting program here today, Berit. You are going to introduce the artist that has made the diploma. Yes, I have the honor to introduce the artist uh, for this year's uh, Nobel Peace Prize diploma. We have, uh, in recent years, um, chosen an artist who makes the diploma for three years and now it is time to introduce uh, a new artist and I am so incredibly proud to um, let you know that one of the greatest painters of Norway, one of the most renowned artists in our country, has in fact accepted to um, contribute to the Nobel Peace Prize by um, creating the diploma. And with that, I will go down and you will have reveal who this is. Håkon Bleken, will you please enter the stage? Och så kan du sätta dig i en stol. We have um, uh, Fles 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 and now I will switch ah. to Norwegian. Håkon Bleken, da har jeg den ære å avduke det første diplomet. Det var ikke så enkelt som jeg trodde. Og vi har to prisvinnere, så det er i år to diplomer. Dette er årets Nobel-diplom. Um, jeg la ikke for tjukt på da jeg introduserte dig. Du er en av Norges mest betydningsfulle kunstnere. Uh, og hva var din tanke da du fikk i oppdrag eller forespørsel om du kunne lage noe i et så lite format og en så bunden form som et diplom? Hva var din reaksjon på det? Ja, mine, mine reaksjoner var jo da, for det var jo mange, var jo da først og fremst å og peile inn hva jeg, hva jeg egentlig skulle lage. Og som jeg sa til, nettopp til kringkastingen, hvis jeg hadde visst hvem som hadde fått prisen, så hadde jeg kanskje gjort det annerledes. 
Fordi at det innbyr jo på en måte til å lage noe mer dramatisk, for er det mennesker jeg beundrer mer enn de to på en måte prisen, så tror jeg det skal bli ganske vanskelig å finne. For den prisen er i år utdelt i to stykker som setter meg i den største begreisning, fordi at det er nettopp ytterligheten som er så utrolig viktig i våre dager. Og at de har fått prisen, det gleder meg meget. Så man kunne jo si at det er visse ting i dette som kan assosieres med med prisvinnere for krisesskikkelsen på Korsjø, for eksempel. For det er jo et utrolig viktig mot de to som har fått prisen av vis denne morgenen. Og jeg tenker for eksempel også på Lars Vilks. Jeg vet jo godt at det ikke var noe, kanskje ikke var noe attentat under ulykken, men også en mann som Lars Vilks som levde i 14 år, med en stadig overhengende fare for å bli drept. Det er klart at det er en enorm prestasjon. Og jeg er enig med Tommy Olsen at han er et godt eksempel på en kunstner som overhodet ikke angrer på det han har gjort. Så jeg har jo da forsøkt å lage ting som kan ha noe med gode krefter og onde krefter å gjøre, hvis man kan snakke om slike ting lenger i våre dager. Det kan jo ikke skje spannfilmer. Og... Og til høyre er jo også da også et landskap med hvor det er dramatiske ting som var i hvert fall hensikten å lage dramatiske ting som lurer i bakgrunnen. Og samtidig som man jo også da helst bør lage noe som er vakkert. Men hva er det å være vakkert? Da må man i grunnen heller lete mellom linjene enn på linjene for å kunne definere det som er vakkert. Det er harmonisk. Den svenske maleren Karl Larsson og Francis Bacon er to bitt forskjellige malere. Men begge to kan sies å være ganske vakre. Karl Larsson med sine familiære idyller i Sverige og Bacon med sine langt fra idylliske ting. Så jeg mener det er... Kunst er igjen det paradoxale som er det interessante i kunsten. Du kan ikke si at dette er fint, dette er dårlig, dette er kunst, dette er ikke kunst, og så videre. Det er uten interesse, egentlig. Alt dette kan man tenke efterpå, og ikke når man får en sånn oppgave. Men når man lager oppgaven, så lager tingene, så kan man jo begynne å forsøke å verbalisere. Men det er jo selvfølgelig først og fremst, og det glemte jeg jo rent ut sagt å si, at det er et ærefullt oppdrag. Og som ble enda mer ærefullt ved at nettopp de to fikk prisen. Det gleder oss å høre, og takk for denne også interessante miniforelesning om skjønnhet i kunsten, som hele tiden defineres av kunstnere. Håkon Bleken, tusen, tusen takk, og vi ser frem til allerede neste års bidrag. Da vil du fortsatt ikke få vite hvem det er som vinner prisen. Skal jeg gå ned der? Du skal holde ditt. Thank you so much, uh, Berit, and thank you so much, Håkon, for that very interesting piece of uh, uh, also about the, the, the prize itself. It was uh, really timely uh, uh, comments you had there. Uh, Berit, now is something that I look very much forward to, and that is Berit Reis Andersen, the uh, leader of the Nobel Committee, explaining this year's prize to us here and everyone on the stream. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and um, thank you for coming here to celebrate the two very new Nobel laureates. Um, yesterday, when I announced the prize, I read up a carefully prepared text that is prepared by the entire committee, um, and where we, of course, um, weigh our words when we want to explain to the world why exactly these two people have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Today I will speak to you in a more improvised format and perhaps also reflect a little bit 
on the basis of all the comments and uh, all the questions that came during the day yesterday. And then I would like to say, to sum it, carefully, uh, to sum it up, um, this year's Peace Prize to Maria Ressa and to Dmitry Muratov is not a prize to journalism as such. It is a prize that, in fact, honors the freedom of expression. And um, the freedom of expression is not only a fundamental human right, but it is a vital instrument to create peace. And that may seem as a reasoning that is a bit far-fetched. And I would like to just make some comments to explain that light line of thought. First, the importance of freedom of expression and how it is connected to peace. And it's always good to reflect a bit on what we perhaps take as granted. We live in a, here in Norway in a very safe society and we know that freedom of expression is something we can exercise. But why is this so important? That it is protected in human rights, it's protected in constitutions. And it is one simple reason, and it's called truth. Um, human beings and societies need truth. They need facts to understand the world, to understand their community, to understand oneself. We need truth. But it's not like one expression in itself is the truth. Because what is truth? We argue about that all the time. Some truths can be... Um, be proven by evidence, some truths are opinions, some truths are experiences that may differ from human being to human being. But w I would still say freedom of expression ensures the value and quality of truth because the sum of all these expressions is probably what truth is. And truth is, of course, very important um, to have a basis to make decisions in a society, in the business communities, in science, in uh, how to fight a pandemic, all these things. And also, they say power corrupts, and it probably does most of the time to a certain extent. And it is important to expose what somebody would like to hide from us, particularly in political leadership, but also in all other parts of life. So um, exposing secrets, um, exposing the truth is one of the fundamental reasons for freedom of expression. But there is also, that is expression, but there's also, it consists of the word freedom. It is such a fundamental freedom that is essential to people, that I can speak my mind, you can speak your mind, we can have an exchange of ideas without being afraid of repercussions. This is one of the most essential freedoms for a human being. And it is a freedom that we should value. And it is a freedom that also um, educates us as human beings, um, where we 
um, learn to formulate ourselves, to express uh, our thoughts in um, private relationships, in uh, public debate, in conflict with other people, and exercising this freedom of truth where truth can be different from person to person. I think it also exercises us, educates us as citizens. Because in true democracies, citizens have to be participants. Citizens give the mandate to politicians. What I'm saying now is very obvious, but it's what we really have to reflect on. In a democracy, we give the mandate to power. And every citizen has a duty to exercise the freedom of expression, to vote, and have an informed basis to form his or her own opinion. But it's also something even more important in this exchange of ideas it is to create a society where disagreement is acceptable, where disagreement is something that is not an insult. It is not a provocation. It is part of being a human being. I disagree with you strongly, but I accept your right to have the opinion you have. And then, on the other hand, the world isn't so simple, because even freedom of expression has its boundaries. And this is also a very big debate. We have two experts that you will hear later. But obviously, everything cannot be said publicly. But where do we draw the line? Do we draw the line um, that you can't make a drawing of the prophet? Do we draw the line saying God is dead? Do we draw the line by publishing pornography? Um, where do we draw the line? And I have um, an image in my head, a photograph from a beach in Nice, I think, where a woman was wearing a swimsuit from her ankles and up, and she's sitting on the beach, and there's two police officers with, lo with well, I don't know if they were loaded, but they're holding weapons, standing behind her. And it's two such enormously strong expressions. The woman expressing that she is a Muslim, with a hijab she also was wearing, uh, and that she didn't want to expose her body in public. And the police representing the French state, the power, pointing weapons, or at least they were obviously not going to shoot her, but the whole situation expresses that this, your choice of dressing in this manner is a provocation to this secular society. So it's such an afterthought. Um, and then there is the value of democracy. There, it's not possible to imagine a democracy without freedom of expression, exactly because it is the people who give the mandate to politicians to the ruling power, and it is also a fact that any dictator will limit freedom of expression. And authoritarian leaders, they have a tendency to declare that they don't like journalists. Obviously, they don't like journalists, because it's a contradiction to their political platform because a dictatorship or an authoritarian leader would like to define the world for their citizens and will not accept that the citizens define the world 
for the political leaders. Um, Duterte has declared that he doesn't like journalists. Uh, Trump has, President Trump has declared that he doesn't like journalists. And um, in a democracy, um, you have to have freedom of expression, freedom of information, and an informed public for democracy to work. It's as simple and as complicated as that. Um, but, and it's also the first sign of a democracy falling apart that freedom of expression is restricted. So that's some reflections on freedom of expression. Then let's have a look at what on earth does it have to do with um, peace. But before I move on to that, let's not forget journalism. Because um, so far I've been speaking of freedom of expression as we're all individuals. But where do we get our information? Where do we carry out our debates? In media. And it is a fact that in the world today, media is more present in our lives than it has ever, ever been before for human beings. We start the morning, we check the internet, we read the newspapers, we watch television, we listen to a blog. It's hours every day where we are somehow connected to media and it influences us. And media can be manipulated. And media and journalism can be used for all the wrong reasons as it can be used for the very good reasons. So societies are very much formed through media and journalists have a, a responsibility of um, exercising their profession in a way so that it is beneficial for society. And I hope that this year's Peace Prize also inspires all the men and women who are journalists to understand that the work they are doing is far more important than only producing a new newspaper, a new radio program, a new whatever. It is, in fact, building societies. So, um, what I, I will make the claim that democracy is necessary for peace. And um, this is a controversial claim. But it is a fact that democracies more seldom enter wars or armed conflict than authoritarian states. But there are, of course, um, examples, the Iraq War, where United States, United Kingdom, Australia, Poland attacked Iraq without a mandate, without really documenting that they were threatened. Uh, and they were all de democratic states. Um, but they say it is no evidence for democratic states going to an armed conflict against each other. And this is called the thesis of the democratic peace. And it can be argued whether how absolute it is but it cannot be argued, in my mind, that our best defense against armed conflict is democracy, even if it is not absolute. It is our best defense in solving problems in a different manner than um, creating um, armed conflict. 
Do I have time to speak a little bit about our prize winners? They're waiting for us. Uh, then I will uh, just say that I could have spoken for a long time about our wonderful prize winners, but what I would like to say, why did we choose them? Simply because we believe that through their professional lives, Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov have showed that living up to the ideals of freedom of expression and protecting democracy comes at a cost for very many people. And these two um, persons have paid a very high price through many years and relentlessly seen the purpose of being a journalist. And they represent the golden standard of journalism. I'm very happy now that we will get to know them a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you, Berit. Uh, it's always a great joy listening to you when you're explaining and uh, telling us uh, about the ra rationale behind the, the prize. And unfortunately, or very fortunately, I would say, uh, we have a surprise for you today. We actually have the Peace Prize winners with us. Uh, first, we're going to talk with uh, Maria uh, Ressa from the Philippines. And uh, I believe she's online and ready, waiting for us. Hello, Maria Ressa. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much. And it is such a joy to let her to you explain many things that are so fundamental to what we do. Thank you. And the role of journalism in a society, in a democracy. Um, how, um, how was your day yesterday? <laughs> Emotional roller coaster, uh, but also incredibly exhausting. And uh, at the same time, you, you infused all of Rappler with tremendous energy. You know, we, we continue, I, I've used this phrase for a long time, we hold the line. Right? Because I think our job is here are where this is what the Constitution says are our rights. You're not going to be able to push us off that line. And and after a few hours after your announcement, uh, my team and I had a very short call in the middle of all of the, the chaos. And it is so wonderful to listen to them laugh. You know, it's been a very <laughs> difficult few years, but laugh together and 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 really like take joy and comfort that we are doing now we're, we've always known we're doing the right thing but the kind of light that you have shown on 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 journalism on the mission on the role of facts um this is it, it's incredibly it's it's a tremendous honor not just for us in the philippines but for journalists all around the world Maria Ressa, it's so wonderful to speak to you. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to you coming to um, Oslo in December. But it worries me. When we called you yesterday, you kept repeating that you were speechless. <laughs> and that is the only thing I will not permit you to be. <laughs> I was stunned. I was really stunned. <laughs> I, I, um, you get used to just taking every step, uh, you know, step by step. You keep walking down the path, regardless of what anyone says. You just follow it, and and that one was really, oh my God! You, sh I have never seen all of the messaging apps I'm on, email, phones, social media explode. You, thank you. Thank you so much for this burst of energy that I hope will will power our investigative reporting in the coming months and years. You, I read a quote of you in the um, uh, in a newspaper yesterday that you had said something to the effect that you were happy that 
somebody had seen what you are going through. Can you please explain to us what are you going through? What kind of restrictions, what kind of repercussions have you met in your daily work on behalf of RAPLA? The phrase I've used, and I've adapted it from, from Al-Qaeda, strangely enough, is death by a thousand cuts, right? It's like every cut is, seems, you know, minor, but every cut bleeds. And this is over years. And what happens is, is the, the body politic will bleed out, will die, and institutions crumble. Um, so what personally, what I've lived through is, I, I, this is my 35th year as a journalist. I know you know this. So I, am, I feel like I've lived through everything, but the last five years since 2016 is unprecedented for me. And I think the only thing I'd add to what you had mentioned is the tremendous role that technology has played in turning our world upside down, in commoditizing news, in making journalists compete against lies laced with anger and hate, right? So this is, this is what has brought the quality of journalism down in some areas, this competition against, for, it's a, a page views. This is, you know, why you have fly-by-night uh, online sites created and you are compared. If you spend eight months on an investigative news piece that is dangerous, that is... That, that exposes power, that stands up to power, you will be judged by the number of page views. And here's the thing, stories that take that kind of rigor are kind of boring, you know? It's, and you can't compete against entertainment, crime, and we shouldn't be forced to. So this is, I think it's, it's really the fact that the world's largest distributor of news are governed by algorithms that reward um, what they spread faster and further, and this is another twist to freedom of expression, This, uh, what they spread faster and further are lies laced with anger and hate. So when you talk to technology platforms, ironically, American social media companies, they will say, this is a freedom of speech issue, right? That the phrases have been turned against us. It isn't a freedom of speech issue, it is a freedom of reach issue, and I, there I, I'm, I'm actually quoting a comedian, right, Sasha Baron Cohen, it's the distribution. And that is a fundamental flaw. This is why it feels like a virus of lies has been unleashed in the information ecosystem. And what you have done by spotlighting the battle that we are on, I mean, you asked me, I've watched my freedoms slowly eroded. I can't travel to see my parents who are in, in the United States and my parents are, my mother is ill. I, I'm not allowed to travel right now. I hope to travel to Oslo, but I will, you know, uh, I will, I should actually put in for court approvals now, right? Um, yeah. We try not to lose hope. On that and note, I, and this is important. We are very curious, what has the reaction to the peace price to you being in the Philippines? Uh, because this is obviously also connected to the fact of whether you will be able to travel to Oslo or not. Could you um, now report to us on the reaction to the peace price in, Philippine, in the Philippines? Stunned Stun silence. Hmm. But unlike, unlike my, my speech, speech list where I kept saying <laughs> speechless, this is just silence. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I, technically, technically, by the by letter, letter of the law, I should have the right to travel. I'm out on bail. And we're fighting the, the conviction in the Court of Appeals. We have the Court of Appeals, and then we can take it to the Supreme Court. And I will fight every step of the way. I was convicted for... Uh, uh, a story that was published in 2012 that I didn't write, edit, or supervise for a crime, for, for violating a law that didn't even really exist at that point in time. So this was a lot of legal acrobatics, which a lot of journalists around the world are learning, are grappling with, right? The lawfare, the way the law has been weaponized against us. Um, I think that uh, I, I am trying to, I, I am fighting for it, but the hard part is that 
you'd never want to be the story. As a journalist, you know, who grew up at the time I did, it's uncomfortable to be the story. But when the government makes me the story, what I've learned is that I at least take that firsthand knowledge of the abuse of power and I will fight for my rights. And it is something I've said to Filipinos all the time. Silence is consent. Do not give up your rights because if you don't use them, you will lose them. So I hope to see you in person and to be fully vaccinated and 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 give you a hug and my uh, my entire teams. I think Filipino journalists are 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 gratitude. Maria Reza, thank you so much for joining us today, and I also want to thank you for your courageousness and for learning us what freedom of speech actually is. Thank you so much. We will see you soon. We could have gone on and on, but we have this hour, I'm afraid. So thank you. We will, we will talk soon, Maria. Thank you so much. And with that, I um, invite Ingvil Ramvel uh, on the stage to... Uh, Introduce the panel. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, an emotional moment for all of us. Uh, I think I can uh, say that on behalf of everybody in the room and uh, hopefully also for uh, all of you watching at home. Uh, we were very lucky to have uh, the new Nobel Peace Prize laureate Maria Ressa with us. And if we are Continuing to be lucky, we might even hear from uh, her fellow laureate, Dmitry Muratov, a little bit later. But now, I am happy to introduce our panel of experts who are going to uh, educate us and uh, learn us a little bit more about the Nobel Peace Prize 2021. Eva Stabel from the Norwegian Journalism Union Welcome on stage. Will we do harm? And uh, next to her, Henrik Udal, director of PRIO, Peace Research Institute of Oslo. And uh, lastly, Aline Kjærulf, associate professor, University of Oslo. Welcome. I'm so happy to be able to move a little bit closer to the panel. We've, we've <laughs> finished with the, with the meeting now, and we can, we can be a bit more uh, intimate when we talk, which is good. Uh, welcome to the Nobel Peace Center and this conversation about the Nobel Peace Prize 2021. I'd like to start with you, Eva Stabel. You're a journalist. You've been working with international journalism in the Norwegian Journalism Union for uh, quite a few years. And um, I want to start by asking you how yesterday was for you, because you, you <laughs> were in a special place when this news uh, was released yesterday. Yes, <clears throat> and happily enough, I had uh, gone to the annual meeting of the European Federation of Journalists in Zagreb. Um, so they didn't even know that uh, uh, journalists were nominated uh, so it was a really great news there, and everyone was celebrating and applauding, and it was um, it was almost hard to leave, but I was called home to <laughs> sit here today, uh, so I did. But they were really, everyone was so happy, surprised, and almost the unbelieving that. <laughs> We're happy, we're happy to have you here and that you Thank jumped you. on the plane <laughs> you know, last night. But tell us, in what way um, do journalists contribute to peace? Yeah, I have no doubt that they do. Uh, in two ways, I will, see, uh, I will say. Uh, one way, uh, the way we just got uh, described. Um, but the other way is to be there in conflict zones or under demonstration protests uh, in dangerous zones. Um, like, uh, I think, uh, to, to tell what's going on there, to tell both parts or all parts, all sides, uh, it's very important for the public 
to, to get to know. But uh, also to save lives and, and prevent uh, escalation. I think with, if, um, if journalists hadn't been at Maiden Square in Ukraine when the soldiers there started shooting demonstrators, I think it would be really a bloodshed there. Mm. And we know Turkey, when, when uh, um, uh, media after media has been closed down since uh, 2016, and uh, the ruler takes it all and controls media and tells just his side of the story. I think it's very, very uh, dangerous for peace. And look at Tigray province in the uh, Ethiopia. It's closed down. We don't have a clue what's going on there, but we're getting some reports from a very few brave journalists and, and uh, which now are in uh, exile, by the way, mm. uh, about atrocities and really bad things going on. So I think um, prevent escalating, prevent uh, uh, situation being a full war, for instance, is mm. yes, more, I, I see. the most important work. The researcher sitting next to you, he's, he's nodding when you are uh, talking about all these uh, examples from around the world. Uh, Henrik Udal, can you uh, tell us a little bit about what research is actually showing uh, about this link between uh, freedom of expression, freedom of the press mm. and peace and democracy? Well, first I have to say I'm exceptionally pleased with this, uh, this year's uh, prize. I think both the, uh, the rationale provided by the committee uh, and the, the obvious, you know, fabulous prize winners uh, really speak to the importance of this prize. Um, I, um, we have been waiting for, for a, uh, a prize in this domain for, for quite some time and had different constellations on our list for the five consecutive years. <laughs> so uh, so I'm, I'm glad that the, uh, the committee finally uh, found the time ripe and I think the time is very ripe for such a prize now. Um, and I think, um, and, and Eva also touched upon this, and, and of course we, our perspective is exactly the research-based one, and I think there are you know, two broad legs that are also research-based that this prize is uh, standing on. It's the broader topic of the importance of uh, freedom of um, uh, information and uh, freedom of expression as absolutely fundamental to democracy, and, and Birgit Reis Andersen also underlined that both today and, and yesterday. Uh, and we know that democratic states are more peaceful, and, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that uh, the head of the committee is so well versed in, in the research literature, and indeed the, uh, the democratic uh, peace uh, theory is, uh, is empirically also very strong. Uh, two states hardly ever uh, fight each other. Of course, there are cases where also democracies engage in war, and, uh, and we know this also from the Norwegian side, but, uh, but certainly uh, democracy is associated with stability uh, and peace. So, uh, and of course, freedom of, uh, of um, information, freedom of expression is a very central part of that. But then there is also the, the second leg, which I think Eva uh, alluded to, uh, and which perhaps is not as strongly emphasized in the uh, rationale for the prize, which I still think is, is important to make, and that is that journalists in the field in conflict areas are often the most reliable source, sometimes even the only source of, of information coming out in a situation that is dominated by uh, propaganda by all the parties. And we, uh, as researchers, also use the information directly from journalists in the field to try to say something about patterns of violence. Uh, so there is a, a very direct link between the work that journalists are doing in the field and the way that this is translating into the analysis and understanding of conflict patterns. Uh, you, you said it uh, yourself now and, and you said it uh, yesterday as well that you've been waiting for a prize like this. Why is it so important, do you think, that this link is being recognized by the Norwegian Nobel Committee in the way that it was uh, in the announcement yesterday? 
because I think these, this, uh, the price addresses, and I, I realize uh, and I agree uh, with what Birgitta Geis Andersen said, that it's not necessarily a price for journalism or journalists, uh, and certainly journalism can also be used uh, you know, for, for good and for bad. And I think the, uh, the issue of journalism and, or journalists also in uh, polarizing, uh, and, and this is of course you know, a fundamental of journalism mm -hmm. that you want, to, you want to try to you know, also um, bring out a story. And, and uh, sometimes this can also you know, venture into challenging terrain when it comes to trying to, to present uh, and, uh, and also you know, make sure that you're, you're reporting in a way that also tries to take down uh, you know, the, the kind of, uh, of um, uh, not, not exaggerate, you know, differences, not exaggerate and mm -hmm. polar, polarize the situation. But the whole discussion now about fake news, about the uh, need for uh, finding ways to regulate and engage with uh, providers of, uh, of uh, um, social media, and I think the big platforms, and there's another you know, dimension of this that is, that is in, re in, in reality a tension between, uh, as, and, and uh, I think Maria has put it very, very nicely, the, the, the freedom of speech versus the freedom of reach. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and that is you know that is a very essential and important uh, uh, discussion now. Uh, the way that we're going to handle this massive uh, availability of information versus making sure that we're providing for some basic facts. Uh, and and I think that is the main reason why I think such a price is so ripe at this moment. When you talk, I'm so happy that we're going to discuss this theme during the whole coming year because there's so many topics to to go into. Uh, but now I want to to move on to you, uh, Anina Shadir. If you are an expert and uh, a warm defender of uh, free speech, what was your reaction to the prize this year? Oh, I was very happy. Uh, I think along with uh, almost everyone else, uh, and uh, also I didn't. Um, I didn't know about all the research that uh, Berit Reis Andersen and uh, Henrik has now uh, gone into, but uh, to me it was sort of an intuitive, uh, there's an intuitive link between uh, the protection for, for freedom of expression and information and uh, uh, as a prerequisite for democracy and thus uh, um, f a, a central prerequisite for, for peace. So uh, I was very happy with that and I'm also very happy the way that the committee has lifted uh, this theme uh, at this moment, uh, because uh, as Peter Dreis Andersen mentioned, this is not a, a prize for, for journalism or uh, journalists. Still, it comes in a time in which um, I guess our, our access to information is greater than uh, ever before, uh, but our access to quality checked information is not mm -hmm. at all uh, the, the way that it used to and, and certainly not as predominant as, as it used to be. And uh, we're being challenged by that because we are fallible human beings and, and we're steered as much by emotions as, as by reason. And so we are very um, uh, vulnerable, I think, to that new public sphere that's broadening out throughout the world. And I think uh, Maria Reza put it, put it very well in the way that, that social media uh, is, is uh, taking on uh, a, a responsibility that they certainly do not follow up at all in the way that they should and could. And, and this is a particular problem uh, in authoritarian regimes, obviously, because they do not have the same kind of uh, access to information that is quality checked by journalists. Um, and I think the, the way that uh, our, our leaders are, are going to tackle this in the years to come is going to be um, uh, definitive for the way that freedom of expression actually works, because this is the entire infrastructure for our uh, possibility to interact with each other as human beings. Mm -hmm. Eva Stabber, you wanted to comment on that. Yeah, but I think it is a prize for journalists. Uh, I know it's a, it's a prize for journalists. I got messages from the whole world of journalists yesterday and everyone was celebrating and they, uh, <laughs> whether you like it or not, uh, they think they feel it as a prize for all the brave journalists risking their lives and risking their health and their families and, and their career every day in areas where this is necessary to, to get the truth. Uh, published. But we, we have the, the chair of the committee here uh, still. Uh, maybe you can confirm that, Verit uh, Reis Andersen. Is this a prize for, for journalism and 
for journalists? It's a prize for the work that, not all the work that journalists carry out. So it's not journalism as such, but in the function of conveying the truth, whether it is from the battlefield, it's corruption, whatever, that is the journalist has a, 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 a unique responsibility for exercising and defending freedom of expression. So in that sense, I congratulate journalists. <laughs> and I never met so friendly journalists as I did <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> 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 oh, I, can, I can just uh, second bear it on this, uh, having been a media lawyer, as long as you're on their side, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just mention one thing that Maria Reza was talking about, the, the, the death of the thousand cuts? That's a short documentary that's uh, uh, on the internet. You can find it by searching it easily, and it's really, really good. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that uh, might lead us over to conditions for journalists uh, worldwide uh, at the moment, Eva Stabel. Uh, 65 journalists were killed on duty worldwide last year. That was 17 more than the year before. What does that tell us about conditions for uh, journalists and their, <coughs> their possibility of doing their job? Well, as, as you know, it really depends where in the world you are living. Um, 92, 93% of all killed journalists are killed in their home country. They mm -hmm. didn't ask to be a, a correspondent or go to a conflict area. They just, they were there when the world, uh, war or conflict started. Um, it means that more than one journalist are killed every week. And that is really, really uh, a bad number, but it was so much worse. Something started about year 2000. Um, and suddenly uh, three, four, five journalists were killed every year at work before that. Uh, the registration may be, may be better now, but uh, suddenly 200, 250 journalists were killed every, every year. And uh, in Iraq, uh, never had so many journalists be killed in a, uh, got killed in a war, uh, war uh, anywhere in the time that we know about. Do you think uh, <clears throat> a Nobel Peace Prize can help protect journalists? Yeah, because we have been working since, uh, especially since 2006, uh, towards the Security Council and the United Nations to get these uh, resolutions that we got. So things are slowly getting better, but press freedom is at the same time slowly getting worse. So it's a, mm. a kind of competition. It's, it's not just that everyone worries that uh, Big Brother sees us, but we see less and less what Big Brother do. And that's what we need to know to protect peace and to, to protect freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. What do you say, uh, Udal, uh, can be the effects uh, of the, the Peace Prize this year? The, I think the broader effects uh, are... Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's not only the the, the world's most important peace prize. It's uh, it's the world's most important prize uh, in in any domain, and of course, it's uh, it's an enormous uh, platform to to speak from. Um, I think there is uh, there is you know there are real concerns about the uh, uh, the individuals in question. So I, I think the committee is uh, is very carefully also considering that, and of course, there have been human rights def uh, defenders in the past who received the prize and, and there are you know similar concerns about them as well uh, I think it's quite clear from uh, from Ressa's uh, reaction that uh, that she is appreciating the prize and, and the same with Muratov even though he couldn't tell yesterday whether this would have 
real implications for, for the way that, uh, that these works. But of course, these are individuals who are exposed to, to begin with uh, and, uh, and are at risk. And of course, that's, uh, that's a real concern. I hope that the price is also contributing to, uh, to give them some protection. And of course, hopefully, it is something that is going to mean that we not only over the next year, but also over the next years, will be discussing uh, what the implications are, how we need to, uh, to strengthen the protection for journalists, how we need to improve the quality and the ways that we're assessing information and how we're dealing with this in the digital age because that is the major issue now uh, in, in terms of, uh, of handling of information. Mm. Uh, Anine Sharuf, um, you, you sometimes worry about the condition for uh, the freedom of expression. Uh, how can a price like this uh, affect, you think, the conditions for freedom of expression and also for freedom of the press? Um, well, I, I think, as Hendrik says, this is uh, the, the most important price in the world, so obviously it gets the, 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 the theme of freedom of expression and information higher on the agenda. Uh, and also uh, the difference, I guess, between freedom of expression, expression as such and, and freedom of the press. As we heard, the, uh, uh, Maria de Sass uh, m mentioned how the, the digital platforms are, are sort of... Uh, uh, using free speech as an argument for their practices around the world. Uh, the, the American way of, of uh, looking at free speech is that uh, you should uh, not have the state interfere in your speech, uh, which is a very different uh, way of thinking about free speech and freedom of expression than the human rights system, uh, the, the uh, Declaration on Human Rights and, and the more binding conventions on human rights as sort of a world system views this, which is to look at that everyone has the right to freedom of expression and everyone has the right to freedom of information, which is a very different way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So replacing the right at the individual level, um, no matter whom interfering, who, who is interfering in it, and the way that the, the, the big tech uh, is interfering with the way that our conversations are, are taking place these days, I think is, is uh, very important. And it also highlights, I guess, the importance of the press as a conveyor of information in a fact-based way based on uh, different sets of, of ethical standards and uh, the search for truth, which is one of the three underlying um, uh, reasons for why we protect freedom of expression as much as we do. It's, uh, the, it's democracy, it's uh, our autonomy, but it's also the search for truth that uh, Berit Reis Almsen uh, was talking about. And I think that search for truth part is being lifted very much by the way that this price is recent, the, the reasoning behind the price. And I think that's tremendously important in a day and age where uh, our access to information is so great, but where there is sort of a gap between those who can access quality checked information and those who cannot. It's uh, um, uh, quality news are uh, behind paywalls, but mm. uh, fake news are free. Uh, and that creates a, a, a really vast problem, I think, that we have to try and, and deal with the best that we can from, from different perspectives in, in the years to come. Mm. Uh, we are running out of time uh, here, but I just want to give you the last uh, word, uh, Eva Stabel, uh, because we are now going to talk about this um, Peace Prize and this theme uh, the whole coming year here at the Nobel Peace Center. And we, when we sum up uh, the year with the Nobel Peace Prize to Maria Ressa and uh, Dmitry Muratov a year from now, what do you hope will be different by then? I hope that um, all nations, by United Nations maybe, have found a way to stop impunity on the killing of journalists. Because nine out of ten killings of journalists are never even investigated, and the killers are not taken. And as long as the situation is like that, uh, you have in many countries, in the Philippines, uh, it cost $150 to get a journalist killed and uh, no, uh, you don't have to go to jail for it. Mm -hmm. We need a system for uh, the international community to go in, investigate and take the killers. Because one journalist killed means a lot of journalists silenced. Mm -hmm. That would be really great.
Let's uh, hope that we can uh, sum up with something like that in a year and that this prize will contribute to uh, protecting the individuals and also protecting the truth. Thank you so much for joining us, Eva Stabel, Henrik Udal and Anine Kjærulf. Thank you so much, uh, Ingvild, for uh, an excellent panel. Uh, we will continue exploring this Peace Prize uh, throughout the next year, uh, as Ingvild said. Um, we will uh, have events, seminars, partnerships to go into some of or more of these issues. I think we all felt that here is so much interesting to learn and to discuss here today. So this was just the beginning of it. And we will create an exhibition, a Peace Prize exhibition, that will open here uh, in this hall the 11th of December, which is a very short time to create an exhibition. But we're so much looking forward to that. So uh, from tw uh, December 12th, we will invite everyone to come and learn more in this place. But today, you are all, re you are all invited also to be part of um, tours here at the Nobel Peace Center, and I thank all of you so much for coming and joining us, celebrating the Peace Prize today. And uh, I'm so sorry we were not able to have Muratov on today, but we will uh, hopefully be able to stream that and put that on our platform so that we can all look at it afterwards. And thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs>